This episode of Linux Action Show is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. And by Ting.com. Head over to last.ting.com and save $25 off your first device. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Linux Action Show, Season 30, Episode 2. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Hey, good morning to you, Matt. Good morning. How about I tell folks about the big show today? Oh, yeah. Well, coming up on this week's episode of the Linux Action Show, we're going to review Fedora 20. Now, this is a big release for the Fedora project, and we're going to find out, is this a cutting-edge distribution, or are there a few dull knives mm. in that cutting-edge drawer? Plus, in the news segment, we have some good news and a look at a new Linux media center, and the Free Software Foundation has blessed an official laptop. We'll talk about that and a few other stories. And then in the feedback segment, it's time to get serious about Debian. And we've had somebody write in asking for advice on their great Linux experiment. Ooh, yeah. So we'll cover that. Plus, we start with our picks, as right. always, man. Always. So the Runs Linux this, pick, uh, this week, the pick was pretty hard. I had yeah. a tough choice. I had, a, I had some great candidates. Uh, however, uh, we've, been ta- we've been following a trend, I feel like, in the second half of 2013. So as this is our second to last episode of 2013... I felt like it'd be good to do another robot runs Linux. Of course. So here we go. Uh, this is now not the robot itself because it's the early days, Matt. You can't just throw an operating system on a robot. No, sir. This is Lockheed Martin's DARPA Robotics Computer Center where they are building robots of the future and the computers they are using to design and program those robots run Linux. And I'll play a little clip of this so that way we can get taken down from YouTube. Cool. The operative autonomy approach that we're using is applicable to a wide variety of autonomous nice. systems. There are unmanned aerial vehicles, and unmanned ground vehicles, and unmanned underwater vehicles that can be used all over the world this even is all Linux. for scientific uh, wow. applications. During the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant disaster, there were events Watch where this. if a... See, he's system. showing the robot how to turn the knob, and then the robot just watches it once, and now the robot knows how to turn the valve, and now he knows how to turn the other valve, too. Oh, see, this is great, so that when, when it comes time to uh, kill off the human race, you only have to show them how to do it once. Yeah, I basically. Mean, that's important, right? I mean, and, and throughout this whole video, there are... Um, clips of them using their computers, all of them running Unity, obviously Ubuntu. Mm-hmm. Uh, pretty cool, though, because uh, we've been documenting how uh, Linux is at the leading edge of bringing the full Skynet dream to fruition. Right, yeah. I have, I have, real mixed, I have a real love-hate thing with it, because I love the fact they're using Linux, but I'm a little not really ready to die. Well, it is pretty amazing yeah. where they show these robots how to do something once. All right. I mean, that seems like, to me, that seems like the breakthrough thing, because like, think about like doing the dishes. Here, robot, oh, yeah. watch me do the dishes. And then you do the dishes once or twice, the robot figures out how to do it, and then not only that, robot can figure out after a few times how to do it better than the human that originally showed the robot how to do it. Well, I, th- I can also think of marital applications. Uh, the, w- the wife wants to go shopping, for oh, example. Oh, no, no, yeah, yeah. No, no, yeah. Oh, it's cuddle time. <laughs> no, no. Here, robot, watch this. Hang on. <laughs> Put on the new attachment. No, oh, no, there'll be none of that. No, no, no. So, I mean, they want to go shopping, and you're not really into it. You know, they can go do that. They got their little all-wheel tracks or whatever. They can go shopping with your wife. It's great. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Now, that would be great. Uh, cool. And uh, so, anyways, uh, we'll put the full video if you want to check it out because there's a few uh, copious shots of laptops, yeah. and uh, those laptops are also running Linux, and that's the DARPA Robotics Challenge. I just think, I mean, it is it is one part extremely creepy, but it is two parts yes. amazing that we're getting to the stage now where, you know, what's also interesting is they have that Tony Stark like uh, light in the chest. Well, I, I think that was by design, and that's and that's where it becomes a little more ominous and a little yeah, more like creepy. why are you making it so freaky? Yeah. Why can't I don't you know, just, man. That's kind of Skynet. Why can't you just put like a lovely little heart and maybe a unicorn and butterflies on there? Uh, I'm trying to look. There was another. Uh, There's another uh, conspicuous shot of a laptop running in Linux in here somewhere. But all of the hardware they show, all of the machines they show, are running Ubuntu. Pretty cool. Pretty cool to see yeah. Linux. It, it's it's cool. I'm hoping that we get to. Um only live through the whole uh, benefit to society phase, yeah, and uh, and yeah. then the whole turn oh, yeah. everybody, uh, you know, maybe it's like a four or five generations. That's our off. best hope. People, no one a... we know is around, right. it, you know, it, whatever. If we if we make it to the part where they yeah. get become self aware and take over, we've lived too long. Exactly. Uh, and you know what? They probably won't live much longer after that. I just want to live to the point where they're just helping me out, <laughs> okay. taking care of some business for Changing me, changing oil, running errands, you know, taking care of the door to door guy, bringing know. my Amazon. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever they're going to be doing. CEO on a stick, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, the whole the whole package. I don't know. It feels like we're going to be living like in a Futurama universe know, someday. Right? Oh, God. Uh, but anyways, pretty cool stuff. And it, it, these types of, the other reason I like these types of Runs Linux picks is because we're now like, it's 2.0 of the Runs Linux. So when the mm-hmm. show started, 
It was like these hardware appliances run Linux. These devices, lots are of all, embedded stuff. Yeah, yeah, all neat stuff that showed you like the whole world runs Linux in places right. you never knew. But now what we're seeing is like major corporations, universities, mm -hmm. cutting edge science applications are. Just by default, when they need a modern operating system, they don't go with Windows because that doesn't answer their needs anymore. They don't. Can you, you know you don't need Windows eight when you're no, programming robots. No. You need a traditional UI that still is modern, that's updated with recent applications, and that uh, and, you know I bet when you're working with hardware this closely, being able to poke away at the underpinnings of your operating system yep. is pretty critical. Absolutely, pretty neat stuff, Good man. Stuff. All right, well, before we go on this week, I have to th say a big, huge thank you to GoDaddy.com for sponsoring this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. Now, GoDaddy's got something brand new I want to tell you about, but then I have a warning for you. Something... Oh, oh. Matt, I don't know if you oh, saw boy. this, but there oh. was some shenanigans involving an airplane. Oh, no. And, oh, yes. Oh, gosh. And, 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 yes, yes. and some splits happened and uh, we all we tra all traveling was had expressions were done yeah it was all of us are to blame all of us are to blame yep. that, that happened and yep. we're going to talk about it but first let me tell you about the great deal that GoDaddy has for you guys because it could be wrapping up at the end of the year so uh, GoDaddy has a brand new website building that makes it easy to create your own website put your business online and find new customers you can choose from hundreds of customizable designs and you are on your way website builder even includes a free domain hosting and my friends also includes 24-7 support. It is go time. Woo! So go over to GoDaddy.com, enter promo code WSB6, Website Builder 6. WSB6 to get Website Builder for only $1 per month for 12 months. There are some limitations. You can find them on their website. Now, look, I've been telling you guys for a while, if you don't use WSB6, Van Damme's going to come to your neck of the woods. He's going to do a face splits right on your face. Boom, crotch in your face. It's your yeah. fault for not using WSB6. Nobody wants the T-bag. Well, guess what happens? Not enough people are using WSB6. Van Damme's busy traveling around America, putting crotches in faces. <laughs> While that's going on, gives Mr. Chuck Norris a chance to go up on an airplane and do the splits in the air. Uh -oh. Now, I'm not blaming all of this on you guys, but I'm just saying, if Van Damme wasn't so busy putting crotches in your face, this might not have happened, right? Think about it, Matt, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's all, it, collectively, it's all of our fault for not using WSB6. Mm -hmm. I, and I'm not saying... I'm not saying that... She, I, first of all... Van Damme still really did it, right? And Chuck Norris... Yeah, Chuck Norris has got a CG of this thing. He didn't really do it. I mean, he kind of like... I mean, it's pretty badass. And then they say, no spirit can walk abroad. The nights are wholesome, and no planets strike. No fairy takes, no witch had power to charm. So hallowed, and so gracious is the time. Now listen. Listen, this is ridiculous. You see how he's up there? He has time to stack all these guys on his head. He has time to come up with this whole Shakespeare spiel. Yep. Shakespeare, Makeshmere. Oh, Never yeah. even heard of that guy until Chuck Norris came along. You know, I, I looked at the planes a little closer, and I'm okay, I'm almost positive that Van Damme's actually flying both airplanes. Right. Well, this is it. This is Van Damme. This is how he gets around <laughs> yeah, right. to do crotches he across America. He actually separates down the middle and then yeah. flies both aircraft. Right. Well, this is generally it. And so, but he's busy doing crotches across mm -hmm. America. So then Chuck Norris goes up, grabs his planes, <laughs> does Van Damme stunts yeah. on his own planes, all because not enough of you yep. use promo code That's WSB6 right. when you check out. See what over happens. Go when you start slacking. See what happens. So go over to GoDaddy.com. Use the promo code WSB6 when you check out to get the website builder for a year. For a dollar per month, that includes the integrated tool to create the site with the hosting. Yep. Spins off a mobile version, which looks great on a mobile device, and they're always working on the SEO optimization. So go over to GoDaddy.com and take advantage of it. And thank you to GoDaddy Dish. for sponsoring the Linux Action Show. Yay! That's why I was typing it in there. Good stuff. Okay, Matt, I got a pick for you this Okay. Week. Now... Mm. There are a lot of music options oh, on the man, Linux. There are so many music options. So you can, many. You got your Spotify. Got sure. Your Spotify, sure. You got your yeah. Armor Rock, right? Yeah. You got your Clementine. You mm. got your Subsonic. Yeah. I mean, the list goes on and on. Mm -hmm. You can just do it in VLC, depending on how you yep. roll. Yep. Yep. So, I want to talk to you about music because this is something a little different. Uh, it is just a music player, just a straight up simple music player with some nice features. First of all, when you import your library, it'll use last.fm to analyze your media and then yeah. go pull down like all of the tag information, all of the artwork, oh, all of that yeah, stuff. Yeah. Nice, right? Mm -hmm, nice. Mm -hmm. So why don't I show it to you? I yeah. got it loaded here on my uh, Fedora 20 installation. Oh, right on. Oh, and, uh, this hey, is that's really sexy. This is music. Yep. It's it's nothing more than just a straightforward music player with some with a little bit of last FM integration. You can see I don't even have like a settings screen here. Yeah. See what I'm saying? It's just it's just bare bones, but it gets it done. Yeah, so we can go in here. So here's my three Ronald Jenkins albums. Now you, you, you get all of your music library here, and I've just randomly grabbed some stuff sure. off of my music server. Um to just dump here to see how it did. It, it did fantastic. It, it went through and grabbed it all. Uh, but why don't we go into the Ronald Jenkins since I have a licensed YouTube, I have a license to this music. 
and uh, you can tell I've been having problems with. Uh, yeah, you know, no, I've I've heard, I've heard. And then so if I go now, it's nothing too amazing. Like here, I'll play a, I'll play this clip right here. Yeah. Now uh, this is it. Uh, in fact, it doesn't even it, it even with the GNOME extension, it doesn't even integrate in here with this. I don't know if that's because of GNOME 310, but it's very basic. Mm-hmm. But you just stash it away, and it keeps playing, and it does what you need it to do. Very interesting. You can see you get your music information there. Right. Very clean, very minimal, low memory usage. That very I simple. like right there, because a lot of times you have a lower spec machine, you don't need a music player. It's just chewing through right. your resources. No. And you know, if you just if you just want something that's going to list your music by artist, album, and folders, and make it super crazy easy, just go in here and find the music you want. Uh, I think this is going to make you pretty happy. If you want something more that maybe ties in Wikipedia integration, uh, pulls down lyrics and mm-hmm. things like that, then you're you're looking more in the Armorock camp. But this right. to me is it's a couple of notches up above VLC, but it's not much more than what VLC did if they just took VLC and gave the playlist. Functionality, which would a yeah. bit of a makeup, right? Yeah. So th- that's why I love this. Is I think it's like well, it's just really visually. I I, I love the way they did the album yeah. art because you can yeah. you can just be like, oh yeah, click. You don't have to like stop and read. And over here is my uh, these are my uh, um, my history. So you mm-hmm. can see like here I was listening to uh, some some Bond yeah. for a little while, um, and then back here you can see I was listening to uh, some Gene Roddenberry uh, audiobook. Mm-hmm. All of it's in here as long as you have the back end uh, codex. Uh, well, and the audiobook play. does have a pretty good beat. Yeah, well, yeah. It's I mean, Roddenberry knew how to rock, man. Let's let's be honest. So that's music, and uh, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. By the way, kind of a cool little bit of info. Same same guys that make uh, MiniTube. One mm-hmm. of our previous picks, MiniTube is the uh, <clears throat> desktop app that lets you watch YouTube videos without Flash. Yep. And on some distros, you even get to download the video from YouTube. Oh yeah. So they also make MusicTube, which is a front end to YouTube to oh. play music videos that are on YouTube. But oh, right on. So they've got a good stuff. Uh, they've got good stuff, and I'll link to their... And uh, they're really well designed. I mean, even the web page is really clean. I yeah. Mean, it's, uh, that's something that's really yeah. rare in open source, yeah. actually. A couple of, so. Just a couple of quick features. Uh, it's super fast. It automatically fixes misspellings in the track files, which is great for me. Uh, supports scrobbling to last FM. It never modifies the files, which is good. It keeps the stuff in its own database, um, which... Sometimes I like the option to write it to a file, but I think it's probably a little safer. And they have a... Oh, oh! I didn't even show you. They have a... Well, you can go play for yourself if you're interested. They have an immersive info view where you get more information about the artist and track that you're oh, playing. There, cool. there it is right there. That's yeah. the info view. And it's well done. Nice contrast. So it's easy to read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's very clean. So that's music. It's and uh, it's probably in a repo near you. And they also have uh, downloads for Windows and Mac OS X mm-hmm. and the Ubuntu yeah. download on their site. Arch and Ubuntu, guys, you guys are sold. Um, I'm pretty sure OpenSUSE has probably got it in their little uh, And it's in the Fedora store. repo. And they just oh, it is in the Fedora repo. Yeah, and they just yeah. had an update, too. They just recently rolled out a brand new version like a couple of days ago. Right on. Yeah. All right. So, last week we talked about Steam OS. That mm-hmm. was the big news. The beta had hit. Yes. But the big surprise for a lot of folks was that it required UEFI, and it officially required an NVIDIA card to oh, work on your computer. Yeah. That puts pretty much anybody that doesn't have UEFI out, and anybody that wanted to play around with it in VirtualBox was also kind of left to go through all of these extra hoops. Well, I caught this on the uh, SteamOS subreddit, and I wanted to point you over to it in case you've been kind of toying with the idea of playing with SteamOS. Mm -hmm. It's a respin already. We already have our first SteamOS respin. You know, that's okay. It's called Ye Old SteamOS y, and uh, I'll link to it in the show notes. It's on GitHub too. It It is SteamOS. Uh, for uh, older computers. That's why it's called Ye Old. Uh. It also works in uh, VM. So it removes the U- UEFI requirement. You can boot on uh, BIOS mm-hmm. systems. It includes an ISO, so you don't just download that zip file. And it also works in VMware and VirtualBox with right 3D on. acceleration. So it's a really cool way to get your hands on SteamOS and just toss it in a VM. Uh, and by the way, they also have, uh, down the road, he'll be updating this to include LVM and RAID support, as well as NTFS modules, so that way, if you want to dual boot a Windows machine, which a lot of new new switchers mm-hmm. wanted to do when SteamOS came out, uh, you'll be able to dual boot using this uh, distro. So pretty cool. Steam, ye Steam, old SteamOS, ye oldie Steam OS, ye whatever. Yeah. Uh, it, is, it is out now. It is cool. It lets you play with Steam OS right away. Again... You could just load Debbie and Wheezy and just and you could, but if you, but if you want repos. that actual experience, I <clears throat> yeah. like the fact that sometimes it's nice to have these things done for you. You can just say, you know what, look, I don't want to do it myself. I just want to pop it in, be done, bam, on a bio system, ATI, whatever. One of the things too is the recovery version of Steam required 500 gigabytes of disk space, mm. uh, but that's not actually what SteamOS requires. So now this is only what SteamOS really requires, which is a 40 gig minimum. Oh. Uh, which is gives you 10 gigs available for games. Cool. Yeah, pretty nice. It does, by the way, caution to you, if you use the automatic version, it will wipe your machine. Yep. And, you know what, why don't I just get this loaded real quick. Yeah. 
Uh, if you uh, want, you can also... Uh, last week I mentioned that there is a, a GNOME desktop underneath that SteamOS. And if you want, you can load up uh, ye old SteamOS, ye, to uh, play around. And this right here is the GNOME 3.4 desktop that uh, ships with uh, SteamOS. So that's... Uh, okay. When you pull okay. away the big picture mode, this is the desktop running underneath <laughs> it's right It's literally here. Debian. Yeah. yeah, it's just Debian with GNOME right there. Wow. You guys can go play with that if huh. you want. So it's pretty cool. It's pretty yeah. neat. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Ye, Steam o ye old SteamOS... Oh, whatever. Whatever. Ye oldie Steam OS E. <laughs> it works for me, man. It's the E I'm, at the end, Matt. It throws yeah, me Yeah, I know, right? It's a ye oldie. You got to do it like an old English yeah, or something. Yeah, but we'll have a link to the show notes. All right, Matt. Well, that's all of the picks for this week. Let's do the news. Hey, it's the news, and this episode is brought to you by Ting.com. Matt Ting is mobile that makes sense, and Ting is our mobile service provider because, well, it makes sense. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I've got the Nexus 5. Matt's got the Note that's 2. Right. We have them both on the Ting network. Ting is only pay for what you use, and there's no contracts and no early termination fees. Think about that. Yeah. You can get started by going to last.ting.com to see what I'm talking about. Ting has all sorts of great stuff. Go over to their rates page while you're there. You can kind of get an idea of what different usage levels will cost, and they have a fantastic video. If you scroll down a little bit, it goes into a lot more detail about how it works. In brief, when you're on Ting, they take your messages, your megabytes, and your minutes, and they add them up at the end of the month. Whatever bucket you fall into, that's what Ting charges you. It's so. really simple because... It's sort of a flip. Just think of it as an exact flip on how all of the other traditional carriers are doing it, where you pay into this large contract every single month, and maybe one month you get $20 worth, and maybe one month you get $70 worth. I got a really great email from a, a Linux Action Show audience member, I think last night, uh -huh. um, and he talked about how they started with one phone on mm -hmm. Ting mm -hmm. and started to realize some savings. So then he subsequently moved three other family members over to Ting, and now they're saving a ton of money. Uh, nice. SMB and FLA sent me for Christmas a box of beer. A box of beer. I didn't even know you could ship. I hope he's, I hope I'm not getting him in trouble. I didn't even know you could ship beer. A really cool box anyway, from Florida, yeah. like all of these great beers. And he's like, and on the on the note, he's like, by the way, uh, basically using all of the money I'm saving from Ting yep. to send this box of beer to you. And I'm like, that's awesome. That is really so, awesome. It, it is really great when you go over to Ting because you can have a fully powerful device that you fully own. This is my. I'm not paying some sort of subsidy to finance this device right. from a carrier that's going to be completely obsolete by the time my contract's done. I own this upfront. This is really the model we're all going to have to move towards in the future. And once you have this locked in, you only pay for what you use. It's six dollars per month for a single line, and then just a additional minutes on top of that. I've still got my HTC One too, and I don't have to worry about the fact that right. I'm not getting all of it because I'm not paying into some big contract. It's right. it's awesome. And when the, when you consider the fact that hotspot and tethering are built into the plan, mm -hmm. and you just pay for the data usage, that's super easy and smooth. And Ting is always rolling out new features. They focus on the customer service, and that's awesome. And their network operator focuses on building out that network. Tri-band LTE is being rolled out. There's no extra cost. It's built in. If you have LTE, an LTE phone with tri-band capabilities and you're in, you're in an area that has tri-band LTE, you'll just get it now on Ting. Tri-band LTE not only gives you better performance, but since you have three bands to work with, if any one of them is suffering something, some sort of interference or congestion, the other bands can pick up. And a lot of the oh, new yeah. phones, like this Nexus 5, support tri-band LTE out of the, right out of the box. Nice. Now, it's not available everywhere, right. but Ting has outlined it on their blog. You can go over to ting.com slash blog. And, of course, it's rolling out to more locations all of the time. That's cool. Uh, they're hoping to have 70 LTE cities come online. I think there, there have been 70 LTE cities coming online, bringing the total now to 300 sites that now have LTE on Ting. Wow. 300 sites throughout the U.S. have LTE. So your chances of getting good LTE coverage are getting better and better every single day with Ting. So go over to last.ting.com to get started. Try out their savings calculator, mm -hmm. average Ting bill. Seriously, average Ting bill is around $33 per month. Can't beat that with a stick. Mine are often around $21 per month. I mean, it's outrageously cheap for a fully functional phone that I use all the time. Waze, data, texting, yeah. constantly. They got a lot of great options, a lot of great phones. Go try it out. Last.ting.com. And a big thank you to Ting for sponsoring Definitely. the Linux Action Show. Love those guys. Love them to death. I... Ting has been one of the highlights of my 2013. It they really, really have. Yeah, it's changed the way I've used phones. And I, I think if you switch now, it's be, it's almost the beginning of the new yep. year. Start out 2014 on Ting, and trust me, at the end of 2014, they'll be one of your highlights too. You'll kind of laugh at yourself that you've been spending this oh, kind of money yeah. with the other guys. And they've got the great phone options now. I mean, you got the Nexus and whatnot. Yep. I mean, it's like, come on. It's gotta go check it out. I bought my Nexus right from the Play Store. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Very cool. All right, Matt. Well, I have some really good news. Uh, the lead developer of Katie and Live's death was greatly exaggerated. Oh, I'm glad he's doing good. I'm yeah. glad he's okay. We didn't totally cover this because I kind of felt like it happened over the summer. 
summer, and it kind of felt like one of these things where a developer gets a little burned out, yeah. he takes some away time, and then the whole rest of the community just kind right. of is left in alert. And we didn't want to necessarily add fuel to a fire that's not even really confirmed. Right, know, yeah, so. exactly. So uh, he writes, uh, so this is coming from a Vincent Pinion on the uh, KDN Live development mailing list, and he says that he's spoken with JBM, that's the uh, lead developer of KDN Live, via phone, and it, good, good news, he's talking, everything's fine, uh, he's uh, doing much better now, he says. He said he was indeed had a, he had a forced break this summer after the period off. He lost his motivation, one being reason they were planning to refactor Kadian Live from scratch. Mm -hmm. uh, they say that the redesign was very elegant and powerful, but there's so many things to redo almost from scratch that uh, just to get old functionalities that it was sort of overwhelming. Uh, this point matters, uh, he goes on to say. It's proved yet again that a project relying on a single developer can be very fragile uh, and... Uh, Vincent goes on to say, my conclusion is that we should stop holding our breath. We wouldn't interfere, and he'd actually appreciate it if some people take some responsibilities on. Mm. So they're looking at the amount of work they have to do, like getting their master branch back in good shape and restoring it back to 096 plus. Uh, so they're divvying out some of the work there. Here's a couple of things they want to start doing. They want to integrate new features like GPU-powered monitoring, and oh, effects, wow. web visual effects, tiling, uh, QT5 port, which would be really big. And he's asking for anybody to be motivated by those things. And I noticed that JBM is still listed as potential, so it doesn't sound like he's totally out of the project. Right. He's just maybe going to have reduced uh, workload. Uh, they say, here's a switch. Instead of starting over from scratch, they want to progressively integrate a new design. For example, moving the first, first redoing the effect stack, then the project manager, then the timeline, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So the whole idea here is instead of doing what happens a lot of times in open source projects where you just... Throw everything out and start over again because you know what we've 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 got a new base and a right. lot of, a lot of critics out there will call that just straight up technical masturbation and the problem is a lot of times when open source projects do this because they don't have enough uh, manpower is by the time they get the software rebuilt it's so far behind that it's become irrelevant already mm -hmm. uh, so they were a little bit worried about this happening plus it's a mom momentous a task so their their new approach now is hey you know what let's just do it piece by piece and I think that's really smart yes I I, I, I think it's the right approach. Because that way, if there is an issue, you you haven't just thrown the whole baby out with the bathwater. You can actually go through and say, okay, well, we changed these individual things. We will address those individual things versus trying to backtrack through a whole pile of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, mm. uh, as as somebody who, uh, you know, we just got done reviewing the Leopard Extreme. Uh, I'm right now on the Ultra Pro. Mm -hmm. uh, I, after using this equipment for the last couple of weeks, I'm so, I, I find myself just almost... Almost a little down that we don't have a really solid video production solution for yeah. Linux, and that, that what what can be done is just not good enough no. yet for me. Uh, it, it is good enough it's good for enough a lot for of people. certain tasks, but not yeah. for the tasks that we need it for specifically. And yeah. I just I just want something to come along. And so when when I heard that they were considering throwing away Katie and Live and starting over, I was really kind of bummed by it because Katie and Live is one of you know in my short list of potentials. To move production over to, and I think for for fi for fi finish editing, you know, for not not for anything live, because right, I'm sorry, yeah. anyone tells me that exists is full of beans. Um, no, I think for finished editing, it's actually one of the it's my go to tool most of the time. Honestly, it really is just because of the fact it does chroma key reasonably well. It does uh, a composite really well. Um, there's a lot of tools that I like about it. Yeah, so. and you know, like uh, Prentice is saying in the chat room uh, is. It's one of these situations where Linux itself is so well suited for the production demands of it, for the performance requirements of it, uh, yet there's just not the tool available to get it done. Right. Um, and, you know, people always, whenever we say this, always say you can They, can't, they give us this, this yeah. hodgepodge laundry list of, of hackability solutions, yeah. and it's like they're not really addressing the specific dynamic Right, because you don't know what goes on in the studio, so you're yeah. you're, you're assuming and, that we have a guy doing all this. And for I, us. trust me, I want to switch yeah. so bad. And so when yeah. I watch this, I'm hopeful. You know, of course, we got Lightworks coming up too, yeah. and all these things. But and they're all fin but they're all finished editors. That's the thing is that any something dynamic does is not even on the pipeline at this point. Uh, not not with the ease and uh, get it done ness. I do. That we need. I mean, so. uh, going to GPU powered effects is almost essential now with video yeah. being as high resolution oh, as yeah. it is. I mean. Because you you got HD now, 4K's around the corner, uh, mm -hmm. plus support to QT5. That's also that makes a lot of sense. But right. all of this is just a ton of work. So you know, for what we can use in Linux, we do like uh, Linux Unplugged for as a great example. Oh yeah, you know, we definitely mm -hmm. embrace the Linux tools. Oh for, for sure, anywhere yeah. anywhere Linux production can be used, we mm -hmm. we use the hell out of it. Um, and, and it's fully explored. So if it's out there, we're aware of it. 
So never been a better time to be a student. Uh, yes. There's going to be 10,000 Raspberry Pis rolled out to school mm-hmm. in the Corella government. I don't probably that, if I, From what I understand of it, this is a, uh, uh, I guess you could call it a state, I believe, with, yeah. within India. And there's, they have their own uh, way of doing things there. It's, they're sponsoring yeah. a, uh, a, a massive purchase of Raspberry yes. Pis for the students. Mm-hmm. Totally brilliant. Because, uh, you know, you hear a lot about um, iPads, right, and tablets going into schools. Yes. But... I think, you know, this is, maybe it's a little more like for the robotics class kind of a thing, but this to me is the ultimate teaching utility because oh, yeah. it teaches you the basics, you show, you can you can visualize everything, how it all works, hook it all up, mm-hmm. and you can yet still have a fully functional computer and the price, and I bet when you're ordering 10000 at a time, they can knock even a oh, buck or I'm two sure off of the it. price. I'm sure of it. And, you know, and, and in that particular state, their, uh, their government type works in such a way that they can do this effectively without a lot of red tape because apparently that's something they can do. Yeah. And that's cool. I mean, they're able to make that work for them. It's all been voted on it's great whatever just you know. a reminder that in november the raspberry pi uh uh guys announced two million pies have been manufactured crap. that's a lot of pie yeah yeah that's and that's manufactured that could even have more sales out mm-hmm, than that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. pretty awesome really good gl- really glad to see this kind of thing and this is the exciting thing and like i said before this is sometimes why i wish i could play a, a more with these kinds of things than yeah. i get a chance and you know q5 sis has sent his into the show which i still have oh well, yeah. had it for pies are cool anyway i mean they're just they're really accessible it they're really awesome. is neat what you can do with it and i look at this and i think this could be a great kind of computer for my son and my mm-hmm. daughter when they're growing up too so yep i'm totally keeping an eye on this is very exciting stuff and ten thousand raspberry Pis are going into schools now that's right it's pretty cool but if you don't want a Raspberry Pi, if you want a full-fledged laptop, well, good news. The Free Software Foundation has you covered. Uh, these are refurbished laptops. They come from an internet, internet re- retailer in mm-hmm. the U.K. Uh, they take ThinkPads. They replace the BIOS with Core Boot. They are refurbished uh, X60s, ThinkPads, and they ship them with Triscoll GNU Linux, which is yep. the Free Software's Ubuntu derivative. They uh, refurbished ThinkPad X60s start out with one gigabyte of RAM, a 60 gigabyte hard drive, can be upgraded to three gigabytes of RAM, mm. and a 128 gigabyte SSD at its max. The Core Boot enabled Trisco loaded laptop is upgraded with an Arthurios AR5 195 802.11 n Wi Fi adapter. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The ThinkPad X60 either ships with an Intel Core Duo or an Intel Core Solo, or if you're really a baller, an Intel Core 2 Duo. The 12.1-inch display on the X60s are backed by a TFT 1024 by 768 panel. So I have a laptop that has similar specs. Uh, it's not an IBM necessarily, or 11 or whatever you want to call them, but you know, it's the same kind of specs. And you know, for what folks are wanting it to do, yeah, it'll, it'll run well enough. Um, I think that its be- best advantage, honestly, is probably that you know it's going to run forever. I mean, it's like a tank, so the thing's going to true. You know, so it's got a lot of longevity working. And, and I guess specs, if you don't, eh, you well, know. if if the free software so, aspect of it is more important than the spec, right. so so you get your free software and you get like, your and you get your longevity. You got those and you got those if, as a bonus. What sure. if you're only using it for web and email? And yeah, you, and I have like I said, I've, it'll work. That ten twenty four by seven sixty eight is a killer, though. Yeah, I mean that 1024 by 768 is like I feel like that's Windows 95. It, it is, and like I said, I've got a you know I've got older I've got older laptops to fit that category. I mean, yeah. if it's I guess it just Netbooks. really depends on your prior. Oh yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah. so here's so yeah. uh, Larbel Michael Larbel uh, from Phronix makes a point here. He says if you want something that will work with a modern Linux distribution. Uh, but isn't open source, but isn't open source down to the firmware, but delivers much better performance and specs than a nearly eight year old laptop. Systems out there like the Haswell based Acer C720 Chromebook uh, or other Ultrabooks support Ivy Bridge or Haswell processors. And there's also uh, many newer Intel and AMD motherboards that are core boot compatible and run on fully open source OS stacks should you want to assemble them yourself. So if you could, like, are you even yeah. going to use this as a laptop when the specs are this low, or are you going to put it on a desk? And if you're going to put it on a desk, you could build a PC that could be core board, core core boot compatible. Which I mean, I'd love to see core boot. I think like like this right here. Right. This is running on all. This System 76 uh, Ultra Pro is running on all free software drivers yep. except for the BIOS, right? Right. Exactly. If System 76 is able to integrate something like core boot, yeah. they would be that would this would be an amazing package. That's true. But I, I honestly now there is no usability aspect of of core boot that I have to have to use this machine. No. Nope. No, it, that, that's just it. It's, I think it really comes down to your priorities. If if having something that is, uh, you know, meeting that criteria is important to you, then this is an option. 
Um, re- and I mean this with all truthfulness. For me, you got to be freaking kidding me. I, there's no way. Yeah, I it wouldn't would, work for me. No either. way I would ever do that. I, not, not even in a million years. I could see it working for some folks. Um, I mean, I uh, do understand you know. that there are people who just don't have that kind of requirements. And you know, the most important feature yeah. would be, and, and it's refurbed, which yeah, mm, not awesome. You know, I, whatever. And it's got I, the, depends on its warranty. It's got the GMA 950 in it, uh, yeah. which is pretty old now. Yeah. But here we go. So let's just take a look. So but, you know, it's an option. It's out there. Um, I would be excited if this is an indicator of further things to come. With oh I don't know new hardware. Here's a three gig but, unit. You know, you know honestly, a three gig unit with 120 gigabyte SSD and a core two probably. Yeah, you'd be all right. You'd yeah, all right. you probably I mean, would yeah, be. You'd be okay. And like I said, it, the machine's biggest benefit is the fact that it's going to run forever. I mean, so that's cool. Um, so I wonder if yeah. RMS is going to be getting this. This would be probably a huge upgrade. Uh, for yes, it. if it meets, if it yeah, because he was using a uh, Chinese made. I forget what, yeah. what the processor was. It was like what was it ARM? An ARM processor? I don't remember what the hell it was. No, some, it was it X eighty six. I think it was. I, yeah. yeah, it was some weird thing that I I could you couldn't have picked a, a lower powered machine. I mean, it was probably about netbook speeds at best. But um, but this might be an upgrade for him and maybe something he can look into. This, so I mean, I, this, I'm trying not to hate on it. I just yeah. I, I, it's really hard. It's got a, it's <laughs> also by the way, even though it's yeah. refurbished, they include MIPS, thank you. They include a what was it? Oh, MIPS processor. Yeah. Yep. Okay. They include an eight cell battery in it too. Um, so yeah, yeah. Because I mean, for anyone that knows anything about hardware. I hate to tell you, but specs are kind of a thing. You know, yeah, I mean, if you're you're Joe Average in the in, in on the street, you're just looking at what it can do. And for most people, it's fine. But for someone, it's it's someone that's spec specific. That's a lot. Yeah, because the thing know. is, is like even tough. Even things like Chrome and Firefox can start to lag on a system that gets that old just because of you know how complex websites are and JavaScript yeah. is now. So I do give them points on uh, providing a really good wireless chipset. I think that was a good choice actually. I've had a lot of success with that. Um good good, bet, good stuff there. So, I mean I'm sure the SATA know. bus can't saturate that that SSD, but even I bet even yeah. having an SSD in there will make an old laptop like that feel faster. SSDs yeah. Oh, yeah. have a capability of opening up a machine that you think is just t- dog slow. And for laptop tasks, that machine will do the job real nicely. I mean, it's certainly compared to you know to uh, RMS's uh, MIPS setup. Uh, this yeah. is a big upgrade, so that yeah. this is an option. I just the biggest I think the biggest biggest hurdle I have it's not so much the specs as it is the refurb. Yeah, uh, we could get something similar that maybe was, was new, new, maybe even. Just put in something a little more modern CPU wise, just just a touch, you know. Something uh, tells me, that, you know, we're getting there though. Getting I bet there. you, I bet you, some of those mm. Chromebooks. If I'm recalling correctly, some of those Chromebooks use Core Boot, and I wonder if you yeah. couldn't just take a Chromebook, have a nicer, yeah. more modern machine. Yeah, I don't know. But you know, but at the same time, hey, you know, I. But it's just like anyone that wants a pre-configured laptop and doesn't want to have to screw with it. They want the they want the uh, FOSS experience. That's yeah. cool. Yep. Here you go. Yep. This is an option for you. And it's reasonably priced, so go for it. Speaking of options, Matt, yeah, uh, we got some more options. It's funny on Linux Unplugged this week, or actually, no, that's going to be next week. Never mind. Uh, oh. We but we get into the topic of um, XBMC and yes. Chromecast and Myth TV, and this this come out. This didn't enter our, our conversation, but this it's interesting now in light of that. Mm-hmm. So on Tuesday's Linux Unplugged, that conversation will come out. Uh, but uh, there's a new version of the Plasma Media Center, version 1.2, just in time for Christmas, Matt. Just in time. So let's take a look at this. So this is so here's the concept: is you have Plasma workspaces, which is for the desktop. You have the Plasma desktop workspace, and then you have these different iterations of Plasma that are for convergence. Right. Let's call it where you have uh, a device that could theoretically plug into a TV, and now you have a TV interface. You have a device uh, that could plug into a like, tablet form factor, and now you have a tablet. So mm-hmm. here's a here I'll play a little video of this. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, this is uh, so. This is here is the uh, uh, this is the UI. So picture mm-hmm. this uh, for those of you watching. It is sort of a uh, less flashier version of the PS inter- PS4 and PS3 interface where there's the horizontal navigation across the top mm-hmm. and then you drill down below in the individual menu options. Uh, you have your music playback and so now picture this. So this is what this is running on is say your laptop. Okay. So you got all this content on your laptop already and you just you're over at the families for Christmas or mm-hmm. whatever it is uh, festivus you plug into the TV over the HDMI port the idea would be is you know how you have those different uh, activities in KDE right you could have a multimedia interface activity you switch over to that now all of a sudden your KDE all of your same apps all of their same data are available they're now rendering in this format it's almost like a big picture mode kind of feel to it. You know? A big picture mode, yeah, yeah. Or, a, or a Unity TV a uni- mode. Yes, there we go. There it what's, is. what's funny, in some sense, is what they're doing here is 
sort of the canonical vision. They're making Plasma Active, mm-hmm. which is a touch-based uh, UI. They're making this for the TV, and then they have the desktop interface. They're using QT, QML, all the same technologies canonical plans on using mm-hmm. to accomplish their same goals, yet here we have 1.2 shipping. Yeah, it's, already, it's already happening. That's like, and you wonder if canonical maybe was just starting now, would they look at this and just start with this? Since it's using all of the technologies they're going to be using yeah. it's accomplishing the same task they're going to be using you would think so you think I, so. I would i would think it would make life easier so uh mm-hmm. wh- what's your opinion on this do you do you ever see a time where you would have a hmm. laptop and you'd actually like maybe you had an hdmi cable just sticking up from your tv and you'd plug it in and all of a sudden you'd want everything that's on your laptop Boy. available on your tv honestly as weird as this is i uh, there was a time that i would thought i thought i did and then i had the ability to do it and i never did yeah um, yeah and so i i honestly i don't think so i know people that would um, but yes. even myself being pretty geeky, I, I I don't. I like that as a KDE yeah. guy. But uh, it's a nice option. I like that this is, yeah, exactly, like the time I spend investing in my Amarok collection, my photo library, right. all of that comes with me when I go to the TV. That, if that you're like. traveling. Now, if you're traveling, I could see it. Yeah. If I'm in a hotel room and yep. I'm thinking, oh, okay, well, my you know my other various media devices are at home. I didn't think to bring them. I've got my, I got my work laptop. Oh, hey, I got this thing. Plug it okay. in. Bam, done. Okay. okay. Uh, so yeah. uh, Peacemaker in the chat room says, uh, my mom wants that. Her laptop doesn't have an HDMI out. She always has asked me to connect something to her PC, so I got her a Chromecast. So I might get her a Chromecast. See, and this is what I'm wondering is maybe uh, all these solutions are a little late since it kind of seems like perhaps the solution bit. is to stream to the TV. Roku yeah. seems to be burying that out. Chromecast seems to be burying that They're out. They're going to have to own the travel niche. I think that's really their only shot because I think at home it's not necessarily going to be – people aren't going to warm up to it necessarily because, as you said, it is so late to the game. But I think for traveling, if you're not thinking to bring your media devices, yeah. this might be an option. That could, and you're not having to stream anything, especially over hotel Wi-Fi. The other thing, too, is – so this same – it doesn't have to be from a desktop, right? It could yeah. be from a tablet. Sure. So if you have a Absolutely. tablet that has HDMI out, you got your mm-hmm. touch interface, you plug in the HDMI port, and this – now when you're talking the travel element, mm-hmm. this could be a lot better, right? Because gotcha. you got this tiny little device. Or hell, it could be a phone even. And there's not, none of the HDMI over there stuff. There's none of the over there stuff. Right. Yeah. It just automatically when you yep. plug in that tablet to your to your uh, hotel TV, yep. it just automatically transforms into the. And most magic. hotel TVs, at least the ones you want to stay in, have a have a TV that's going to work with it. So. The thing is, is it all comes down to like you can spend all this time on the code. You can make the coolest interfaces ever, mm-hmm. but if if. If there isn't a good device execution and if there isn't an install base, it almost just isn't going to matter. And so we're still at the phase now where we have a lot of great options for different converged type devices. (laughs) Right. But and and the thing about the yet. whole convergence thing is they better get on it because eventually we're going to get to a point where it's going to be too late. It's like okay, we perfected it, but the rest of the world's moved on to something else. Well, I feel like and Chatham's so. touching on it right too. Is I feel like the rest of the world is going to dial in on DLNA, Chromecast, and yeah. and AirPlay, and what because honestly, you know what fixed that problem? A really good cancer scare. You know, like Wi-Fi is, <laughs> Wi-Fi is going to melt my brain or something. Because I mean, seriously, if you could manufacture a really good scare, whatever it may be, yeah, um, then you could sh- then you can kind of shove people. Ooh, that's an obvious. I thing. like this. So, plasma active, the cancer scare option. My face is melting. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, I could totally. You could totally do that. So, uh, pretty neat though to see uh, they're already at one dot two and they're yep. moving fast. And uh, I'm going to check it out. And I think eventually, you know, just being a plasma desktop user, I think I'm going to get this yep. stuff. I and think. no, I just want to point it out. I'm not making fun of people with EM sensitivity. I know people that are, but I am making fun of uh, scares, not people. So. so you can the source is available right now, which yeah. is another nice thing. Right? That's cool. So you can actually try it out immediately. Yeah, there's so. some other convergence totally. projects out there where the source is not yet yep. available. Ubuntu TV. All right, so uh, there you <laughs> go, Matt. That uh, <laughs> that wraps up. Now I want yes. to touch on something. Uh, I'm going to start a thread over, or somebody will, over in the somebody Linux will. Action Show subreddit. Yeah, did you know we had a subreddit, Matt? We have a subreddit. <laughs> LinuxActionShow.reddit.com. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, next week is our final episode mm-hmm. of 2013, and we want to do a predictions episode. We will uh, we will need your help though filling in the gaps. I can go back and look at the old episode and yes. kind of figure out what we but, predicted. Yeah, it, it, it refresh my memory, refresh his memory. Yeah, yeah help and, us out. Or, and then and then we want to do a retrospective. Right. So uh, whatever you guys think was the really big story of 2013, like mm. Steam OS, um, what? Well, you tell me, and we'll start a thread, Ooh, yeah. and you guys can throw your ideas. Because there's there. so many things to choose from. Fact, trying to assign importance, it'd be cool if we assigned importance based on some of your feedback. Here's what I'm thinking, yeah. oh. people. So we need a link. We'll need a link so that way we can show it. So mm-hmm. you're your big headline, I'll start a thread here in a minute after we get off the air. Right, right. Uh, so go over to the Linux Action Show subreddit. I'll try to sticky it. 
Okay. Uh, or maybe... I'd sticky it. I, I yeah. d- Just make sure. And uh, what I want everybody to do is vote up the story. So don't mm. vote people down. But in no. there, people, in the comments, people go in there, put a link to the story you think was the big story of the year, maybe a brief reason why, and yeah. then other folks cast your vote if you agree by voting it up. Like if somebody else posts the same thing you were going to post, give them an up vote. Yeah. Because it's then, all the same thing. It's not like you're getting ranked yeah. points for it. And then we'll rank so. them and we'll see what people thought the big stories were and we'll put those into our retrospective. So linuxactionshow.reddit.com and look for a discussion thread there. And uh, mm-hmm. that's how we'll, we'll incorporate that into next week's episode. Super simple. Should stuff. be a really fun. I love doing these end of year oh, wrap-ups. Yeah. Plus, then we got to our 2014 predictions. Exactly. Ooh. And, my, and see, this way, if you guys are helping me, my predictions won't be things like when I said the Google IPO was a mistake. Uh, uh, Apple's never going to make money. Mirror's going to ship uh, first. Yeah, Mirror's going to ship first. Monkey you did, suit. You did you know. call a couple things this year, though. Like <laughs> no, I've done better this year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you got you, <laughs> these I, are distant problems right, that I had. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> Before I had you guys helping me out here, you know, <laughs> saying, "Oh my God." All right. Google uh, IPO. <laughs> so uh, go find the thread in in yeah. the subreddit on that linuxactionshow.reddit.com and help us out with that. And then tune in next week live to also join us in the conversation. JBLive.tv, 10 a.m. Pacific. Uh, and jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get it in your time zone. Okay, Matt. Well, that's all the news for this week. Let's go review Fedora 20. It's time for us to take a look at Fedora 20. But first, I want to thank our segment sponsor, System76 Creators of Machines Born to Run Linux. Oh, yeah. I'm running this week. This is the uh, the last week. I've got the Ultra Pro here in front of me. This has been a fantastic laptop with a new upgraded keyboard. I've been rocking this thing. And uh, what's really cool is this was really turned out to be the perfect Fedora 20 review machine. Uh, because everything I'm running in Fedora, there, I did not have to load a single proprietary driver. Right. Everything's just working right out of the box. Every single component is supported by Fedora's kernel directly, which is awesome. So you're even HDMI out of this bad Mirrored boy. Mirrored video yeah. out of this yeah. bad boy, wireless, uh, 3D yep. acceleration, um, sleep, suspend, everything. The, all the hardware, all the key controls, everything just that, works out of the box under Fedora. Yep. This is what's great about System76 is they build these things to work with the Linux kernel. So that way, you know, you get it, you get a great product that runs Ubuntu, and you can load anything else. I've got, I've also, by the way, last week, I loaded Arch on this uh, Ultra Pro. So, and it works Yeah, and it just runs out of the box. You don't have to worry about now, it. I think the Rattel performance is the sleeper of the uh, mm-hmm. System76 machines. Mm-hmm. Super compact, uh, low noise, but tons of power in there. They've got the Haswell processor in this thing. You can get tons of RAM. You can get onboard video or dedicated video, whatever you need for your demands. I have two words for that box. Plex box. No kidding. I'm just saying. I'm just yeah. putting that out there. This Plex would make box, a, This right? would make an amazing place. Oh. You know, you could make a whole home server out of this oh, thing. Yeah. No oh, problem. you totally could. Yeah. You can put up to 16 gigabytes of RAM mm-hmm. in this thing. Uh, and if you're doing the home server, just stick with the Intel graphics. That's right. Totally. And then you save a little money and you get a good performing graphics chipset. Uh, this is this System76 really makes some uh, wonderful machines. So go over to System76, get yourself something nice, and tell them the Linux Action Show sent you. Right. You will not be disappointed. We hear from folks all the time who grab themselves a new System76 computer because they heard about it here. I mean, hell, my main desktop's it. an old school Rattel value. Still love that machine. Yeah, tons of great work. This yes. this is one of the finest laptops oh, I've ever yeah. held. It is such a nice machine. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he saw me come and he started crying. I thought I thought he's just happy to see me. It's like no, he knows that these things are leaving. So yeah, it's like, oh, that's man. true. And this is I know. Those of you watching on the live stream will get me watch get to watch me destroy the installation before we send it back. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to send it to System76 with Fedora 20 on it, so that way they can just check it out. If right? Yeah, yeah. I'll just, just leave the that user data if they want to try it. Sure. So. Fedora 20 came out uh, this week, and after a few delays, but nothing too major, no, it's, no. it's totally cool. And this is, by the way, one of the cool things about Fedora 20 is it marks the 10th anniversary of the Fedora project itself. Uh, back, uh, Fedora Core 1 came, back, uh, came out on November 6, 2003. That doesn't seem like that long ago. Uh, does, I mean, here we are, we're, getting years old. Later. we're getting old. Uh. So the question is... Is this 10-year anniversary release one of their finest yet? Ah, hmm. that's the question. We'll attempt to answer that. Mm. Uh, because, you know, really, uh, I, I, had a, I had a new approach okay. when I was uh, trying out Fedora. Because there's a lot of cool things in Fedora. Like, by the way, yeah. uh, they shipped it with a, a running version of Wayland, uh, yeah. which you can run GNOME under Wayland, and it works really well. Uh, I don't have a way to show it to you right now because I don't think the video mirroring works. So no, just, no, I, don't, I don't believe it does at this point, this early in the You can game. go try it out if you want to, mm-hmm. though. Uh, it's, it's So there's a lot of cool technologies that I'm going get to get into with Fedora, but I had a new approach okay. when I was trying out Fedora because I have struggled to review Fedora in the past. I, I, yes, we've both struggled with that for sure. So I came at it with a new perspective. Like, what if I was going to just switch whole, whole hog over to Fedora from Arch? Okay. What would I need to do to make it a usable system for me? Okay. Is that amount of work... 
uh, acceptable and is the end result desirable? Right. That's what I wanted to ask. Is it even a plausible experience right. for you whatsoever? Mm-hmm. Sure. So to start out, Fedora ships as of right now with kernel 3.11.10. That's what I'm running on here now. GNOME 3.10, mm-hmm. KDE Plasma Workspace 4.11. Cinnamon 2.0, as well as XFCE and uh, already. So out of the gate, very critical core functionality you're looking for is already provided. Cinnamon That's 2 cool. is going to be popular with a mm-hmm. lot of folks, I uh, would think. Right here. Uh, by the way, also one of the new things in Fedora 20 is ARM is now considered a primary platform by the Fedora project. Wow. And a couple other big changes. No syslog by default. Uh, System G Journal now takes place of uh, syslog. And mm-hmm. the other thing is no send mail by default. Fedora did a little evaluation. They said most users don't require a mail transport no, agent. No, and, and thank you for that because yeah. seriously, it's a desktop. Come on. You know. Yeah. So that, those are your those are your core specs of them. Fedora when you install it. This is mm-hmm. what you're going to get. I've got it loaded right here. Uh, here's a look at the desktop running uh, almost completely stock. I've actually that's not true. I, I, I <laughs> you tweaked it a little. I bit. tweaked it. I tweaked I was it. Saying, yeah. But I tweaked it for the better, and I wanted to show you a couple of things that you get mm-hmm. on Fedora right out of the box. So one of the nice things is they're one of the first distros to really integrate with the new GNOME Software Center. Yes. This sits on top of uh, Package Kit, and it brings an app store to every distro in a sense. You don't have to have yeah. Ubuntu Software Center. It doesn't. It's not specific to uh, Fedora, but they're really the first to fully go whole whole hog mm-hmm. with it. And I want to show it to you because this is something we often talk about with the other distributions. So you can see here, I have uh, Musique installed. I mm-hmm. installed it from the Software Center because I've installed. It, I have a red remove button here at the top, but otherwise it's pretty minimal. A, a, a description, no screenshots. So if you want screenshots, you got to go to the. Uh, Right, website, and that's is, something I would have liked to have seen. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, I definitely am. Uh, I, I'm a fan of it. Actually, yeah. overall, I'm actually kind of like it. And because it's using Package Kit, and my user is already authorized mm-hmm. to install software, like here, I'll install Gary. Right. So now I'm clicking install it. I never get prompted for my password because during installation, uh, I, I made I made my user an administrator of the computer. Sure. And now it, what's cool is I get this GNOME notification here at the bottom once mail is installed, and I can just launch it. So it's a real nice way to just get right up mm-hmm. and running with a piece of software once you've loaded it. Plus, Agreed. you have that ability to keep shopping while something's installing yeah. in the background. And then I can go back in here and I can remove it. Plus, I get a list of all the installed software that I've installed from the software center and I, or from the GNOME software center, and I can go in here and remove it quickly. So say I didn't want Zononic anymore, I could just click remove, and now it's uninstalling it. Of course, exactly. like now I guess I now, now you get, to, but, but that makes that. sense. It also prevents you from accidentally clicking sure. remove and going, oh crap, what did I just do? What yeah. did the, what did I uninstall? You know, what's nice too is it so. also hand- handles your OS updates. Now Good. this was a little hit and miss for me, but yeah. what's cool is when you got a lot of updates, this update tab pulses. Warm, warm. You have updates. Warm, warm. <laughs> I kind of like that though. You know, I, I honestly, I I thought I was going to hate on this, but I actually like it. I actually like yeah. it a lot. Yeah, it's it's it has room to grow. Like it needs oh, screenshots. Yeah. Yeah, it needs, it needs screenshots, more info. But, but it's the right. It's the right layout. But you know what it's, it's right not approach. doing? It's not lagging out, right? Right. And it's when I click install, it doesn't yeah. kill the system. Exactly. So, And you have different subcategories here. Mm-hmm. So here's the internet subcategory. So I can go in here, I can install Pigeon, I just click that, and then it, now it's loading onto my system. That's right. Nice and easy, real simple. So that's GNOME software, not specifically unique to Fedora. No. But it, it's a great example of how technologies often premiere on Fedora, or mm-hmm. if they don't premiere on Fedora, they have their first implementation well, and in Fedora. F- Fedora traditionally is very much GNOME-centric, I found, that they definitely, yeah. uh, they, and that's good, because, you know, Open uh, OpenSUSE is very good about uh, being KDE-centric. You know, right. It's kind of their go-to thing, so they're yeah. really good at that. If you're looking for a GNOME experience, these are usually the guys you go to. So, another piece of software that ships with Fedora that is going to be available for other distributions, but again, it's out of the box right, right here on Fedora, is Boxes. Uh huh. And this one, I'm still, I, I'm still, I'm still, I'm still wooling it around a little. All right. So, I'm still think of boxes is like this. So, boxes is a simple GNOME three application yeah. to access the underlying virtualization capabilities of Linux. Yeah. Uh, so, think VMware, mm-hmm. think VirtualBox, mm-hmm. but it's included with your system. You don't have to install anything right. extra, and because it's part of the Linux kernel, you don't have to worry about updates breaking it. See, and I like, I like the idea. It's just I, I didn't have a. Real opportunity to actually try it out myself, but as an idea, I think it's interesting. But I would be fascinated to see how it compares to other options. So it's, I'll give you a quick rundown of yeah. it. It's, uh, it's definitely meant. It's not meant for sysadmins. It's, it's meant for end user desktop, which, which is users. good. And yeah. I like that. And that was when I was reading through the gist of it. I was like, well, that's so kind of cool. I have three virtual so. machines right here. But just to show you just how simple it is, like when I click new. Here's the here's the uh, here's the setup wizard. I click continue. It automatically detects these ISOs in my download mm-hmm. folder because I've used that folder once before. So here's four ISOs immediately right. available to me. Yeah. I choose the ISO image I want to install. At this point, I'm done. 
But I you, can you could create. literally go there and be yep. good. But or you but could customize. If I want to fine tune, but you see, still very oh, simple see, options. This is nice. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. overwhelm you at all. Mm-hmm. You just mm-hmm. choose the disc size. You can choose which devices are attached to the system. You choose how much memory. You don't find yourself getting lost. I mean, it's not like when you're working with VirtualBox and it's like right. the laundry list of crap that most right. people probably don't have a clue. Right. And now if I so. click create, it automatically would fire up. Uh, but since I already have an Ubuntu box, so mm-hmm. but I thought you know for the extreme challenge. Here oh, is yes. here's a Windows 7 VM right. running under boxes using the built-in virtualization just into my system. I didn't have to load any extra software. I didn't have to go out and get a repo. I don't have to install any additional add-ons or or VBox modules. I am now running Windows 7 under boxes just using all the built-in that software that comes with Fedora. Wild. Now, I wonder with something like this, for example, let's say you have a VBox uh, set up from uh, like VirtualBox somewhere else and you want to drop that into a local import directory. It. Yeah, I, wonder I if don't you think you could that. use boxes to do it, but I think the VDI format would, would the work. The VDI, okay, so VDI. Yeah. So you could actually take an existing VDI and perhaps run that. I believe so. If yeah. so, that would be, that's that's making, that, see, for me, that pushes me hard on certain machines into Fedora. Now, the, the performance isn't probably as fast under Windows as it as like a VirtualBox would be. Sure. But it's usable. Okay? Oh, it's not bad. And if you just needed application compatibility and you don't have to worry about installing anything, right. this and is And really you're trying nice. to do something quickly in a pinch. You know. The other thing that's cool, too, is because it's running in the background, I can I can leave that system running right. and go about doing other things. That's cool. Yeah. and ah. I, I, So I've got SteamOS in there, mm-hmm. and I've got uh, Ubuntu in there. Yeah. I've also got Corora. Now, are you familiar with Corora? No. Mm-mm. This wasn't. This was probably. If I was going to switch to Fedora full time, this is probably oh, the direction the new, I would have gone. This is the newbie uh, Fedora, right? Right. It's yes, a respin. Okay. Yeah. They uh, Corora. Uh, they have a couple different editions. I chose the. I ran the KDE one for about a week just to yeah. give it a shot, and it, it was, it's essentially it's Fedora with like some text issues fixed, codecs included, flashes there. Repos are added, like RPM Fusion. Some of the stuff you might want out of the box is included with Corora. So here I am right. running Corora. Based on Fedora 20 under Fedora, which is kind of neat. Wild, right? So you can see this would be the KDE experience if I wanted to run Mm. KDE. Uh, And the performance is better under Linux guests than it is under Windows. Go figure. Yeah, go figure. Uh, But Corora is kind of of my uh, recommendation for those of you who have wanted to run Fedora, but you've had problems with... You know, things not being available for you. Not sure what to set up or what things to toggle or what to choose. Yeah. And sure. The, the Corora project at Corora Project, K-O-R-O-R-A project. Yes, now Corora. I remember, because I remember everybody kept calling it Newbie Fedora. I'm thinking Newbie Fedora, and I actually did check it out at one point. I couldn't remember the name of the life of me, though. Yeah, I guess you could call it that. That's uh, what I call because, I mean, it's really, from what I remember of it, that's kind of what they were targeting. I mean, yeah, it seemed it, like. Yeah, it just lets you, yeah, it lets you get, well, for me, it's about saving time. Right, Like right. Uh, ships with Chrome installed, right? Those yeah. kinds of things, VLCs mm-hmm, loaded, mm-hmm. all the stuff that I would have totally tweaked Fedora 4, are there. I ran that for about a week, but then I decided, ah, you know, gosh, if I'm going to actually be reviewing Fedora, I need to straight up run Fedora. That's kind of like Arch versus Manjaro. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, kind of the same way. thing. It's kind of like, it uses, why not just use it? Yeah. Uh, it does use the Ar- uh, Fedora repos, though, oh, okay. which is nice. Okay, so it's more like, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Now, another thing that I found that made Fedora 20 uh, really great to use is Fedora Utils. Yes. Fedora Utils, in fact, I have it installed right here. I'll show it to you is uh, an application that uh, one part repo manager, two parts uh, add software that lets you do things like, uh, uh, oh, I got updates. Look at that. So I can do essential tweaks here, and Mm -hmm. if I select essential tweaks, I'll get options like make font rendering better, install Flash. So if you install a straight uh, uh, Fedora installation, and then you want to add Flash, you want to add Chromium, you want to do these things, Java, Mm -hmm. that kind of stuff, Fedora Utils makes that easier. So you see, it's just a checkbox here. Oh, yeah. So configure configure my cache options, set up an SSD I.O. schedule. I just check that box. Install Microsoft Core Fonts. I just and check that box. And it tells you uh, whether it's uh, configured or not configured. Isn't that Installed nice? or not installed, and so on and so forth. So, so you can you see know. how I went through. I installed Java this mm-hmm. way. And these get you up and running uh, uh, on Fedora a little bit faster. You can also install additional software. You can manage the repos with Fedora Utils. Oh, that's nice. This is one of these programs that adds a few things to Fedora that I wish were there. Chiefly being... Team viewers, even. I mean, God, that's great. Fedora wow. really is sitting on top of all this really great technology. Yum is really good. Yes. Yum is faster now, but it's still the hardest distribution to get software into that's it not is. in the repos. That's right. Ubuntu has the PPAs. Arch has the Arch user repo. SUSE has the build service mm-hmm. and the software.opensuSE.org. All of those things make sliding new software into those distros phenomenally easier. Right. So on Fedora, one of the things I found is essentially... It's just kind of a crapshoot. Some some sites will give you like a W get to go get a, re- yeah. a a repo file and then add that repo file. Then Everybody's got a different approach. Yeah, to it. Right. It, it's messy. It doesn't work. Um, so I'm hoping one of the things after Fedora 20 that might start happening is a project called Fedora.next. Uh, and this yes. is a refactoring yes. of Fedora 
they're going to start with Fedora Core. They're mm-hmm. going back to Fedora Core. That's going to be like this base OS. And they're going to have rings on top of it. Then you're going to have like uh, uh, more functionality as you go out. Mm-hmm. And they're going to have a separate workstation project, a desktop project. In a sense, it's gonna. It's that not. A, cool. It's not a separate open source project, mm-hmm. but they're different tracks. So they're going to have different targets for mm-hmm. Fedora. Right. And this is one of the things that might kick off with Fedora tw- uh, 21. And I'm hoping if they have a different track now where they can focus it. This is the desktop spin. They can start to look at some of these features, like adding new software on here. Because I'll give an example. Like getting Steam was like, do I go get a repo right. for Steam? Do I go get an RPM file somewhere for Steam? What do I do? Um, and I just felt like all the other distros have a much better story and solution there, whereas Fedora is like, just go figure it out on your own. Mm-hmm. And but, these kind of tools make it a little bit easier. Oh, I'd say it'd make it a lot easier, because if you look at it, it's got everything from Chrome to Dropbox. I mean, all Dropbox things I use. Yeah. I mean, Steam, Skype. Skype. Yeah, I mean, yeah Steam is right there. So I mean, hell, they've got Team Viewer. I mean, that's yeah. a Wine app. That's fantastic. Yeah. So it's like, I don't even have to know how the hell it installed it. It yep. just did. Um, that's so cool. The, another, cool. Another tool that makes managing uh, Fedora kind of nice is... Uh, I showed you the the GNOME Software Center, right? Well, this yes. is Yum Extender, and uh, Yum Extender is a front end to Yum. Think like how how Syn- you have Syn- Synaptic or whatever. You call exactly, it. Yeah, you yeah. got the Ubuntu software, and then you can load Synaptic. This is this this is the Synaptic for Fedora, mm-hmm. and you can see in here it's already showing me I've got a whole bunch of updates to install. That's why it's in red. I yep. would assume. Yep. yep. Even though I just updated yesterday. Right. Yep. So, yeah. Hey, it's early That's, days. It's bleeding edge. Uh, yeah. um, and then the other thing is, is I have found this will find stuff that the GNOME Software Center doesn't for some reason. Right. And I don't know what that's about. I don't know if GNOME Software Center is looking at a limited set of repos. But um, uh, could be. Uh, there was a Twitter client I tried to install, for example, uh, which shows up in Yum's extender, does not show up in GNOME Software Center. And, yeah, but uh, Synaptic, or whatever you call it, uh, the same thing. I found that to yeah. be, yeah, with the software store versus it, there's a lot of stuff that does not show up in Software Center that does, in fact, show up in the repos. So I think that may be the same logic, and that's okay. Yeah. That's actually good sometimes. This is an easy way to manage your software repos. You can mark just the updates. I can look at just installed software. I can look at just available right. software. Performance is pretty good because Yum's performance is pretty good. You can see I just pulled up the whole... Package yeah. list there pretty fast. Yeah, that was really fast. Yeah. And, well, and based on my limited experience with, the, I installed a few different applications. Didn't seem to have any problems. Um, in the past with Fedora, I have had lots of problems. Yeah. So that was an improvement that I experienced. What was your experience with that? I I found so w- what I looked at is because I didn't have to load any proprietary drivers, right? And because I found these utilities, mm-hmm. I got myself up and running with not just a usable desktop. But like a desktop that I really like, mm-hmm. uh, I I find this gnome. So I I find this gnome implementation to be just pretty much straight up gnome. But right. you you know you got to change a few things like the icons. I'm willing to invest that time now. I've just sort of I've just sort of you know yeah res- resigned myself sure. to that fact. Mm-hmm. Install a few extensions. Trade out trade out a few themes. Like I installed a different uh, title bar theme, uh, which you can't tell in in that program, but you can tell right. here in the terminal. I think it's all really quite nice. Uh, and 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 if you had that. If you had an answer to the Arch user repo repository, this would probably be the closest thing. This, I mean, it's, it would really come down to mm. Debian unstable or mm. Fedora, and the and the key part for me now is how hard is it to go to the next version? Because one of the advantages oh. is if if you're not going to ship me a desktop that's totally usable out of the box, like if I need to install themes, if I need to install icons, mm-hmm. if I need to install all this extra software, which is fine, sure, because I realize that's not Fedora's purpose. If I need to do all these things, I don't want to have to throw it all out. In a couple of months, because I'll tell you how I work. Honestly, is I, I load up a new machine, I start with all defaults, and then it, I, I let those defaults grade on me as long as I can possibly bear it, and then I tweak everything I've got to tweak to make it usable, like change the icons, right? Mm-hmm. And then I ride that out for a little bit longer, and then then once I can't stand it anymore, usually in one <laughs> big manic fit that keeps me up way too late, I tweak everything, right? right? But once I get to that yeah. stage. I don't want to have to redo it all in six months because usually by the time I spend all the energy to make it just the way I want, I really love that desktop. Exactly. Like that's my perfect, that's my desktop. So uh, when I was looking at Fedora, I thought, okay, Arch has this handled, right? Yeah, it just, just going to keep along, rolling. You don't care. Right. right. Debian Unstable, essentially you get the same thing, right? It just yeah. keeps on rolling. So what are my options with Fedora? Well, I was doing some digging and I found this software project. It's an official software project from the Fedora guys called Fed Appropriately Up, named. Right? And it's essentially... <laughs> Uh, Fedora updater. Uh, since 18 or so, this has been the official way to upgrade to the next release of Fedora. Now, I did some reading. Plenty of people use this and had problems. Oh, a so lot of times. Is it, is it early days, would you say, or is it I, just need more? Growth I help? think upgrading a system like this is just difficult. Right. And I think one of the things is some folks did the upgrade and they didn't have the latest version of Fed up. Oh. And so that didn't work Ooh. out so well for them. Yeah. 
Uh, but it's it's hit and miss. You know, yeah. they 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 try it out and they give you a list of common problems people run into when they use FedUp going to. Fedora you know, but 20. I'm also someone that for years, if it's not a rolling distribution, I'm doing a clean installation. I do yeah. not as, and I know that seems really backwards to so many people. But for I, no, I've had sense. so many problems with upgrades to where, and sometimes I don't even catch them right away, and then I'll be using the system and find out that something was borked. Yeah. Um. I you know I just back up my yeah. back up my user data and it's just like look fine whatever. I just feel like if I'm investing, I all wish that I didn't time, have to. I wish I didn't have to either. Yeah. And it's one of the things that kind of keeps me off Mint, even though I think Mint's a good release, too. Mint's a good release, yeah. And But the good thing is, though, so many, not all, but a lot of the tweaks are kept, you know, kept in your user data. Some tweaks are not, obviously, but, you know, a lot of them are, that it makes it usable. If you can back up your software list, then, eh, you know, it's okay. I, I honestly think so. this is probably one of the greatest releases of Fedora. Uh, Easily. But I took Easily. a lot of tweaking to get it there. So it what, did. But so what did? You, how did you feel? Did it take too much? Was it too much tweaking? Uh, no, because I didn't. I, you know, I don't really. It depends on uh, if it's not my primary desktop. I don't do a ton of tweaking with the desktop anyway. But what really won me over is installing. You know, Dropbox, Skype, things like that. I didn't have to go fishing for the latest hope to God it's accurate tutorial to find out. You know, if there's any tweaks when you're mm. actually installing these apps. Am I going to have problems with uh, you know doing it the old fashioned way? The fact that these tools took care of it for me meant that I had all the things I care about immediately. Um, did not try and install something like Spider Rook or anything, but I definitely did Dropbox and uh, yeah. Google Chrome and all these other things. Really, really simple. Skype even. Hell. Yeah, and mm -hmm. and performance was good. Performance wasn't bad. And it, I feel like uh, if you want to just ride the raw dog of Linux development, and, yeah. and you don't want a rolling distro, this is probably your. This is about. This is your perfect compromise. I think you want so. bleeding edge, but you yeah. don't want to roll. Because look, you yeah. know, Red Hat's not yeah. going anywhere, so Fedora's not going to shut down. Nope. Yep. Uh, and they really do seem to be trying to make it better and better all the time. The KDE desktop was good. The GNOME mm. 310 desktop is good. Yes. It does show you there are a few. There are. I still think we're pushing the limits of this type of release because, I think for so. example, uh, M uh, Mesa 10 is out now. And there is considerable gaming uh, performance improvements with Mesa 10. In mm -hmm. fact, so much so that Valve went out of their way to to shoehorn it into the Steam OS release, even though Debian Stable doesn't support it. Right, which is you know shows you that it's important. Um, and because because Fedora is using kernel 3.11 and an older version of Mesa, it's not able to take advantage of some of the more recent improvements in 3.12 mm -hmm. and Mesa 10. And you're just kind of left either switching to Rawhide or now waiting until Fedora 21 comes along and hope right. they include those things. I'm not saying that's a bad model, but for somebody who's aware of these types of things, you really just want a system that can just go out there and get it right now. That's true. If that does, if that kind of thing doesn't bother you, then Fedora 20 is probably the perfect release for you because it's fast. It's been super stable for me. Yum has been performing great. You got the new GNOME Software Center, which makes software discovery. It really re improves yes. software discovery and on it's, Fedora. And it's not ugly. You know, and I, I like that. And you get to play with like the latest version of Network Manager. They just finished making some mm -hmm. tweaks too. You get to play with boxes. You get to play with a lot of the latest things like System D underneath the hood. It's a really compelling offering if you're willing to make some changes right. and you're willing to maybe reload every six to eight to nine months. Sure. Uh, yeah. Then like I said, take take my advice. You know, just back it back up your software titles and uh, make sure that you've got your uh, user data backed mm -hmm. up. And then who cares? Now, Crash Benedict in the chat room is saying it uses uh, kernel 3.12, but if I do a uname, and I'm up to date except for this morning. Oh, I am on 3.12. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. Surprise. So when <laughs> I, I guess when I did the uname earlier, I got 3.10. Yes. Yes. Well, if okay, it does, well, that's then good. I remove that. I remove that. Would be really my mainly my only criticism is you kind of get stuck there. Oh, oh, I should mention. Speaking of gaming, yes, um, Steam. Steam. So this was kind of interesting. So I don't know what's up, but I had uh, a few games here loaded. Like, ah, oh, I just got. And I, I played it for a few minutes. Oh, wait, not that one. I played it for a few minutes the other day and then uh, went to play it today. And now it just doesn't load. Oh, interesting. I don't know if an update borked it or Might what. Might have, yeah. But I haven't had an update bork it before. So now BitTrip doesn't run either. Now some games do still run. Like Portal still runs. Killing Floor still runs. Right. Uh, Salvation Prophecy. So still this runs. may not be the most uh, Steam friendly uh, option in the world, but that's okay. Not everybody's running Steam, so I mean that's. But that's something you should know if you're a Steam person. Uh, proceed with caution. Yeah, and I, when I when I run on the command line, it gives me a, a library error, and I forgot what it was now because I did it this morning before the show. But you know, uh, I I did have it working. I just yeah. don't know why it's not now. So the Steam challenge right now is mixed. Mm. It's mixed. And it could be because Fedora is pushing out a ton of updates. As the uh, you know what I'll do in the break. 
before the feedback segment, I'll apply all the updates and try to see if those games run again. Yeah. Just see if maybe it works. I think it's a good idea. Just just to see if maybe something was resolved in the updates. <laughs> yeah, sure. sure. Yeah, sure. So there you go. Yeah. This is uh, Fedora 20, I'd say, perhaps, the best release from the Fedora project yet. And you get to play with fun stuff like boxes and uh, Polaris in the repo now. And I'm going to say it is the best simply because of the fact of what it's actually addressed. Um, I'm no longer having uh, yum issues, uh, thank God. Uh, you know, so things are actually installing without borking and breaking and, you know, like I would maybe say in CentOS, for example. Um, you know, things like So it's a good experience there. I can get all the applications I want relatively easily from one little nice little checkbox list. I love that. Um, boxes looks like something cool I want to spend a little more time with. I have not. I did not try that. Yeah, I, I would say it's good if you just want some some straight yeah. up basic uh, Ex- virtualization. N- not that. putting a lot of emphasis on performance, but yeah. more just on having it accessible and easy. Yeah, sure. and, and not having to worry about future break- right. breakage and stuff. Yeah, yeah, like virtual box. Yeah. Plus, exactly. it's just neat to see kind of you know what they're working on with that. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm going to definitely say, based on other experiences with Fedora in the past, going back years. Uh, yeah, yeah, easily, easily the best one just based on usability. And I'm going to show the update screen. Here it uh, is. Yeah. Oh, I just this it just it's such a nice way yeah. to display it on the command line. So you mm-hmm. can see, like, I'm going to get a new version of Network Which Manager here. I'm going to get uh, some new themes that I've added, uh, new Shotwell update. So some new stuff in here. Now, of course, I don't see the library that was kicking out an air from Steam, but I'll give it a go anyways. Yeah, it's just really nice and it's super fast. Like if I hit yes here, uh, Yum just kind of rip rocks and rocks. Oh, I did have a few repo errors because. Um, when Fedora, oh, did you? Wait, I think it was just they were slammed. The repos were slammed, could be, and could so be. Uh, like I get, I got a few 404s, so I couldn't, oh, I couldn't yeah. update, update, update a couple of times. Sure, but sure. I think that's all just that's new release happen. jitters. But otherwise, you, you found, I found the repos to be pretty responsive, yeah. as, you, as you did too. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah, really solid release. Great work from the Fedora project. Happy 10 year anniversary. Can't wait to see what they start doing with Fedora next. We'll be keeping an eye on that too because they've just made now. They maybe now that they've peaked, they're going to go off in a new direction, right? And they're going to try something kind of different. What I'm thinking, yeah, I, you know, I'm trying to find something to hate on here, but I'm not having a lot of luck. Um, you guys actually did really well. I'm, yeah. I'm impressed. I'll hate on the icons. Okay. Yeah. Well. Yeah. The. the, yeah. the but that's that, for me though. That's easily whatever. I just change them. No yeah. big deal. And they're not as bad as KD's default. No. Icons, so. No. Yeah. And I, and I and things like wallpapers, icons, and yeah. colors. Fonts <laughs> I, matter. Hey, man. I even know. kept the default wallpaper. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's the default. I was like, yeah. hey, and that's you know? actually not bad. No, no, it's not bad at all. So I think that overall, it's like you know, even gnome. While I'm still kind of on the fence with it, it's like. They did such a good job with it that I, I really can't complain too much. I'm, yeah. I'm quite happy. They're 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 definitely benefiting yeah. from GNOME 310. Really, you GNOME 310 is really where GNOME 3 became usable for me. Yes. So they're benefiting from that. KDE 411 is absolutely fantastic. Mm. I, I, a, yeah. a lot of the software stack they're now depending on has gotten mature, and they've added just enough Fedora finesse to bring it all together to make it really awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm gonna probably keep it on the machine, the test machine that I have. I'll probably keep it on there for a while because I don't have it, a reason to remove if it. If I was keeping yeah. this, I would absolutely keep right? it on this, and that's one of the reasons I'm gonna send this to system. 76 with it still on there because I think when they see <laughs> yeah, this, like, they're going to hey. be pretty impressed. Yeah, it's like, oh, hey, this is a bit yeah. What's this? Oh my God, this is great. Yep, so, totally. uh, two big thumbs up from the Linux Action Show. Go download Fedora 20 and give it a spin if you're willing to put the love and care in to make it the way you want it. Because yes. I'll, I'll be honest. We're giving we're holding Fedora to a bit of a different standard. Yes, because you do have to change the fonts to make them look good. You have to change right. quite a bit of things. You need those Fedora utils, you, which you can go out and find repos for. I have it linked in the show notes. You mm-hmm. need those kinds of things to make it fully usable, in my opinion. But if you're willing to invest a little bit of time with Fedora 20 and make it your own, it can be a really great desktop. That's uh, right. And I'm really happy to say that. Exactly. I think if you're intermediate to advanced, you're going to love it. If you're a beginner. This may not necessarily be for you, but I think yeah. it's definitely worth investigating for everybody. And you know, so. uh, if you have uh, if you have all uh, so- all hardware, there's open source drivers for it. You're going to have a good time. Oh yeah. All right, Matt. Well, that's the Linux Action Show's look at Fedora 20. Uh, that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. Hey, Matt. Yes. Before we get out of here, I want to read a couple of emails. All right. Ryan writes in with. Uh, Question about time to take Debian serious is with the ongoing okay. uncertainty and controversies in the Ubuntu camp and the recent release of SteamOS, is it time to start taking Debian seriously again? I know that Ubuntu has been preferred operating system for many in the past few years, but the excellent Debian edition of Linux Mint has helped Debian come up as of late. He says, speaking of Linux Mint, you guys should do another review of that OS when the latest update yeah. pack and iOS uh, or ISO or, yeah, you know, those things, yeah, ISOs. So, yeah. Come out in January of 2014 with Cinnamon 2.0 and Mate mm. versions. Hmm. 
That might be interesting in a January uh, yeah. Cinnamon 2.0 with Debian under the hood. That could be kind of that interesting. That could be very cool, actually. So he's actually saying to try the Debian edition. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, I would agree. It's with been that. a while since I've done that. Yeah. Uh, on another note, have you guys thought about taking the Debian Unstable Challenge? Much like your Arch challenges in the past, isn't running Debian with unstable repos much as a rolling release as Arch is? Either way, no. it would be nice to see if the experiences you have running the most bleeding edge Debian for a month and are reporting back your experiences. Thanks again. Uh, mm. Well, I think with the latter, at least as far as the Debian versus Arch, um, while they're both rolling releases and they're both very bleeding edge, I think the big differential is the uh, the uh, Arch user repository versus uh, Debian repositories. Right. I think that there's not even a question that Arch well, destroys the Debian. There's, I, I don't know, and this could be a good reason. I to could take be the, wrong. This but... could be a good reason to take the challenge. But here's what I would worry about: is Arch. There's two different underlying philosophies here. Yeah. Debian unstable is meant to be a testing ground for the next stable release of Debian. Arch is meant that when you push something in the repo, users across the board are going to start using it immediately. Right. So, the, so it was probably tested and not put into an unstable repo. There's the, the stakes are at least higher, right, mm -hmm. on the Arch side because there's more everybody's yes. running off of that. That's right. Whereas Debian, they always, and I'm not saying this does happen, but I'm just thinking it could happen. They could always fall back on, well, you are using the unstable version. Sure. There, uh, there's going to be some breakage. Hence the word unstable. Yeah, I would think so. So I mean, I think it's. Uh, you know, yeah, it's something we can consider for sure. Yeah, I think we will consider because we've gotten it a lot, and I love Debian. It's it's one of my first distros, and it's just it's an awesome it's an awesome base. So maybe it could make a fantastic yeah, desktop. I, I, yeah, I, you know, I'm always looking for like the the next island. Like is Fedora 20 the island I jump to from Arch if something goes wrong? And so Debian, I think, deserves to be in that short list. So I, it's I, worth a try. Yeah, I tend to be more of a Debian spin guy. Uh, I wouldn't like Linux Mint Debian Edition. Okay, sure. Um, back in the day, Simply Mepis, I used to use the hell out of that back in 3.1 days. I was big into that. So I'm, I was always big into the spins, but as far as Debian proper, and mm, We'll see. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. All right. Well, Nathaniel writes in with the next email. He says, hey, Chris and Matt, I'm a 16-year-old high school student. Mm. And he says he hugs fans of the show. I don't know what that means. I guess that just means okay, if you want to hug from good. yeah, if you want to hug from Nathaniel and you're a fan of last, just let him know when you see him in person. <laughs> when people see me using Linux to school, I always get odd looks, even from a few teachers stopping to ask, "How do I get Windows to look like that?" I've also noticed a lot of criticism from people at school who know about computers from using Linux, uh, who yeah, uh, saying things like Linux is a waste of time and there's not enough Linux compatible programs for Linux to be a good option. As a result of this, I've designed an experiment that will be uh, conducting over the next year or one to two weeks, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, I will be using Ubuntu Linux as my primary OS on both my laptop and my Nexus 4. Whoa. Wow. Uh, to test the ability of Ubuntu to be the all-in-one beast that the world wants, somewhat similar to the uh, somewhat similar to an Apple experience. Would love to read this. have you read this on the show and get your thoughts. I'll be making daily blog posts during the experiment beginning Monday the 23rd at thatguynatk.com or Tumblr, thatguynatk.com. ATK.tumblr.com. Hmm. So he'll be tumbling his experience as a 16 year old switching to Linux for one to two weeks. And he's going full hog on, wow. the, on the phone and on that, the On the phone's brave. I'm going to give you points there. I think, as far as on the machine's concerned, when someone brings that up to you, uh, I would remind them that nobody, and I mean nobody, in the commercial in the uh, consumer spaces actually uses operating systems. They use experiences and they use applications. Right. And if those two things match on Ubuntu or whatever it may be, their argument is is null and void at that point. Yeah, because quite honestly, and I would shoot back with this: Windows as a as a user experiences sucks. Yeah, hard. Yeah. So you know, but applications yeah. that's argue they could argue that. Yeah, and I think too so. as new as new platforms emerge to deliver applications like Chromium web apps, uh, what Firefox is working on, these kinds of things, uh, people will stop. Stop so closely associating apps with operating system mm -hmm. and just can that device run the program right. they want. And the underlying operating system probably won't even be a factor in the conversation. And if you fast forward this conversation 20, 30 years, yeah. I bet you it's almost all Linux and yeah. they don't even discuss what, oh, you know, Windows maybe will be on some mobile devices. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but I, I really agree with Matt here. It's more about the applications they use. And if there's an application that's available for Windows that is not available for Linux, then just straight up. Windows is the better platform for Absolutely. them. That's just what it comes yeah. down to in their mind. It Especially if it's something they use frequently. That, that's yeah. a strong argument. Freedom but far, factors yeah. and cost and, and yeah. open source, none of that matters if they have to have a, um, Adobe Audition and Windows is the only place to get it. They've got to run Windows. Yeah. And you can play on the words. You know, It's like, well, actually, I don't even use applications. I, I accomplish tasks. I, I'm actually doing this or that or the right. other thing. And I a like, lot of times. I like you know. what Nathaniel's doing here because he is by taking this challenge, mm -hmm. you are reducing your reliance on these software platforms and these applications that are locked into Windows. Right. And so that leaves you the freedom 
maximum flexibility to make the appropriate choices that work best for you. And so one of the problems is, is you can get locked into these programs and then you're stuck, right? But right now you're taking that bull by the horns and you're finding what works for you on these free platforms. So down the road, you know, like it, for example, um, there was a there was a Microsoft utility that allowed you to assemble thing uh, pu a Microsoft publisher, right? Oh yes, there's my, ways my to accomplish there. publisher tasks with Linux applications. But if you always started, like say, making your restaurant menu under publisher, mm -hmm. then three years down the line, you're not going to want to just switch to something else. So Linux isn't a viable option. And I'm speaking from some personal family experience here. We tried this, yep. and they were oh, all bought into publisher. Uh, and, yeah, and try uh, up, uh, using uh, different publisher files from different releases with oh. newer versions. <laughs> That's fun. Yeah. That's a lot of fun. So. Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, it's all about taking the right steps now. That's true. Uh, so, next week, uh, kind of a crazy week at JB, a lot of our shows are pre-recorded, so we won't necessarily have live shows on the right. calendar, but you'll still have releases at their regular release time. Mm -hmm. So, um, for the most part, all of the shows will be intact. But uh, there, if there is anything live, go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. Like, we could have, we might have a faux show on this Saturday with uh, some fun stuff. With the oh, community. that's cool. Uh, but uh, so you can check that out. We should have your regular favorites available uh, on demand mm -hmm. as always. And I will also, as this is uh, the last last before the the holidays, I wanted to give a big thank you to everyone in the community and to those of you who have helped out in any capacity from from right. moderator to developer. Uh, we're a small team here at Jupiter Broadcasting, yes. and because of the real group effect of you guys out there collectively working together on this stuff, Jupiter Broadcasting has been able to accomplish something much bigger than I would have thought possible. And, and, and honestly, something beyond what I would be able to do on my own or even just a small team here at JB. So mm -hmm. a big thank you to our community. Also, a really big thank you goes out, especially this year, to everyone in the community who contributed financially to support our work. Um, you know, that, that we had the Amazon situation hit us hard. You know, if you brought a shirt, anything like that, I really appreciate all of that. Your help not only gives us peace of mind during the holidays here in my house, which is nice. It's still going to be a lean Christmas, but at least we're not in panic mode, which right. is really what I was worried about. Exactly. Uh, and you also changed the game for us from a disaster where I thought maybe we'd skid across the a year end mark by using emergency measures, maybe cutting back on shows. Mm -hmm. You guys change that conversation from what are we going to cut to let's move ahead with our studio build plans for 2014. Wow. That's huge. And that sets us up for a big 2014 and, it, and it's going to allow us to grow and bring in more guests and do even more amazing things, which I'll get into in next week in the 2014 predictions episode. Nice. But I just wanted to say thank you to everyone out there. Everything awesome. from the drives, drives Jupiter, the t-shirts, donations, people's time and effort. You guys have really helped us big this year. Really been, and I think like the whole network has been able to take it up a notch in a big way because of yeah. your guys' support and help. I agree. I agree. I, I've been really impressed by how everybody came together, especially when in that time of need. Yeah. That was awesome. You guys rock. Yeah. So thank you very much. Now, don't forget, you can watch this show live and participate in our live chat room yep. by going over to jblive.tv on a Sunday. Last is going to be keep on going. We just miss all of the holidays. So uh, last yeah. will be here on Sundays. And you can get it in your local time by going to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. Matt, is there anything you want to point folks over to uh, throughout the week while they're I think right now, just uh, going to go with the uh, make sure to catch our recorded uh, version of uh, Linux Unplugged. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's good. really where we're at. We had uh, a really good chat about fixing support in, in the Linux world mm -hmm. and what's wrong and like the, yeah. what might. And, you know, we had a guy who was starting up a Linux support company, and he heard this episode, and he said it's given him a lot of good ideas. Mm. So that's, that's awesome. really cool. Yeah. That's great. And then next week, we got a look at uh, some really cool stuff, kind of into the future a little bit. Right. Uh, and some, some multimedia devices, and it was a really good discussion, which we already recorded uh, last week, but we'll have it available on Tuesday for downloads. Good so yeah, stuff. If you're not listening to Linux Unplugged and you got some extra time, maybe some of those other podcasts you listen to are taking the holidays <laughs> off, go check out some Linux Unplugged if you got That's some right. extra time. That are good. All right. Well, if you want to get a hold of us, just go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com and pop that contact link. Mm -hmm. Choose Linux Action Show from the dropdown. Or even better, start a thread in our subreddit, linuxactionshow.reddit.com. Yes. We're always lurking there. It's actually a better way to get a hold of us because we check that more yep. often. That's right. So... All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for tuning in this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. Have a happy holidays, and we'll see you right back here next week. Uh, all right. Hair is fine. Yeah, yeah. Do not panic. This was not a bad hair day. I'm not trying to hide little, it little uh, animated cat. Charum talked me into it. I didn't want to do it. They made yeah. me. You got to own it here. So here you go. This is a Christmas present Oh, God. For you. Jeez, thank you. Get you. To open. Why don't you open it now, though, just for the fun okay. so the oh internet gets God. to see it. Oh, my God. I'm just... Well, it is Christmas here. We got the Christmas, Christmas tree. I just felt yeah, like, you know, no, this is awesome. Holy crap. Felt like we should do this so that way we were really in oh the Christmas spirit. Of course, I should be drunk to be in the Christmas spirit, but <laughs> yes! how awesome is that? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 That's too that funny, right? Awesome. Okay. So I got to totally show this off here. It's a bacon, a bacon platter. It's designed just to hold your bacon. 
right that there. is going to get so much crazy use. <laughs> and what I like most is the fact that the gentleman here is totally creeping on his old lady. Yeah. Cause it's made from swine This white sure tastes fine Just bring some to the picnic, baby You know you want to stuff it in my hamper But please put it in some Tupperware Cause I don't want to be a porky chancer Oh, well, Matt, we weren't much, yeah uh, when, when is that March? When is that? Uh, when was that episode? Andrew remembers. It was. Um, it's in the, in the subreddit. I believe. If I, memory serves, it was March something. Okay. It'll be March something fourteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, but, um, and I've been trying to. Hold, I've been trying to save it. And I've been tempted to wear it, but it's a certain size, and I keep getting larger. So I got to make sure I can. I got to make sure I do it here pretty quick before <laughs> I can still fit into it. Last time, man, it was just. It was. It was just all skin and balls getting into that thing. It was. It was pretty tight. So. Uh oh, really? Too much information for you. It's pretty tight, huh? It's pretty tight. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm I'm pretty much just down to my skivvies, getting into that. <laughs> so I didn't nearly need that <laughs> bit of information. No, I'm wearing boxers and whatnot. I'm just saying, man. I got to get up all in there. Yikes! Know. So when you're sitting here, you're gonna be basically <laughs> naked. Although if you think about it, you're basically naked right now, just with some cloth, <laughs> right? We got fancy loincloths on. Oh my god! Yeah.